Hello everybody, welcome to JTV. All right, I think we need a bit more of a Hanukkah atmosphere in this room. What do you think? Maybe we get like a menorah or something. That's pretty good. Maybe some candles in the menorah. Maybe some atmospheric lighting. Maybe a bit of music. All right, enough of this silliness. Let's get serious. So, Hanukkah. <laughs> Imagine you're in my shoes and you've got to explain to someone in a nutshell the meaning and themes behind Hanukkah. So you might just jump onto Wikipedia if you were lazy, or if you weren't interested, or you had to catch a flight or whatever, I don't know. But let's say you had a bit more time, or if you wanted to be a little bit more academic and rigorous and accurate, uh, you might prefer to go to the original Jewish texts that talk about what Hanukkah is all about. Um, and you know, why it was instituted by the ancient Jewish sages as an eternal Jewish holiday. So I want to show you what the rabbis of the Talmud thousands of years ago had to say about the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah. So let's go to the root, the ancient sources, and see how the Talmud explains Hanukkah. The Talmud asks, what is Hanukkah? And it says, beginning on the 25th day of the Hebrew month of Kislev, there is a Hanukkah period for days in which we don't deliver eulogies and don't fast. What? Okay, let me, let me stop you right there for a second. Imagine it's your job to explain Hanukkah to someone, and the first sentence you would assume will take you right into the heart of the matter. But the Talmud seems to start by saying it's a time when we don't deliver eulogies and don't fast. What's that got to do with anything? You'd expect the first sentence to be pretty important in diving into the issue, and yet we're presented with something that seems almost like a footnote in what Hanukkah is all about. So anyway, the Talmud then goes on and it tells us all the usual things that we'd expect to see. It says Hanukkah commemorates a time thousands of years ago when the Greeks invaded the land of Israel and they tried to wipe out not the Jewish people, but Jewish practice and values. Not to destroy our bodies, but our souls, our spiritual mission. And despite their small numbers, the Maccabees somehow managed to drive them out, the Greeks out of Jerusalem in a miraculous military victory. And then they restored the temple which had been defiled by the Greeks. And despite only being able to find one day's worth of pure oil to light the menorah, it actually lasted for eight days. And so it finishes by saying, and so the following year they established a festival of eight days to give thanks to God. All right, fair enough. Now, I'd like to show you a totally different section of the Talmud and to share with you an insight brought to my attention by the brilliant Rabbi David Foreman in one of his videos, on his amazing website, Aleph Beta, a link to which can be found in the description of this video. This section in the Talmud talks about something totally different. It's trying to identify the origins of a totally different pagan festival of lights, which seems to occur at the same time of year as Hanukkah does. In doing so, the Talmud takes us way, way back to the very beginning with Adam and Eve, at the time of the very first winter experienced by man. The Talmud says that Adam noticed as winter approached that the days were getting shorter and shorter and it was getting darker and darker, earlier and earlier. And he saw the leaves falling off the trees and animals going into hibernation. And Adam said to himself, woe unto me, the end is nigh. He thought to himself, God did say, if I eat from the tree, I'm gonna die. Maybe this is it. Maybe it's the end of the world. He'd never experienced winter before. And so he fasted and prayed for eight days straight until the arrival of the winter solstice. And then he noticed after eight days that the days didn't continue to get shorter, but they actually started to get longer again. And Adam declared, Min hago shel olam. Ah, this is just the way the world works. It's the cycle of nature. And so he went and celebrated for eight days. And the Talmud ends by saying, and the following year, he established a festival of celebration to celebrate God's control and management of nature, of God's constant sustenance and supervision of the physical world. And it says that generations later, pagan festivals were set up that corrupted Adam's festival, where they would simply celebrate nature itself, the sun, the stars, etc., rather than the power behind all of nature, that powers all of nature, almighty God. By the way, I think this section of the Talmud is really fascinating because if you think about it, it really isn't just the Jewish people who have a holiday of lights and celebration around the time of the winter solstice. It seems to appear across so many faiths, cultures, nations, and traditions from the more obvious ones that we can think of, but even perhaps the less well-known. 
And perhaps the Talmud is suggesting to us that this is coming from a very deep rooted place within the human condition, this festival, and all its offshoots, going all the way back to the very first man. But what's it got to do with Hanukkah? Seemingly the story of Hanukkah and Adam are totally different and unrelated. Well, that may seem true, but one cannot help but ask whether the Talmud is inviting us to compare and contrast these two stories. Because the language it uses in describing these two stories seems to draw some unique connections. First of all, there are both celebrations that occur at the time of the winter solstice, with Adam and Hanukkah. Secondly, we have the eight days of increasing light that both Adam experienced and which we celebrate on Hanukkah. Thirdly, we have the same language used by the Talmud in both instances when it says, quote, the following year they, i.e. Adam or the Maccabees, established a festival of thanksgiving. Very rare and unique phraseology used by the Talmud. These are possibly the only times the Talmud uses this particular phrase. And finally, and perhaps most strikingly of all, consider our original question. How does the Talmud introduce Hanukkah? It's a time when we don't fast and don't deliver eulogies. Now, think about Adam. What did he do in our story when he thought the world was ending? He fasted. And he said the words, woe unto me, the world is coming to an end. If you think about it, he was actually delivering a eulogy to the world. He thought it was all over. And the Talmud introduces Hanukkah as a time when we don't fast and don't eulogize. It makes it very hard to resist an obvious connection that is being brought between these two texts. So what are we to make of all of this? Hanukkah happened seemingly as a result of a miraculous victory against the Greeks. What does that have to do with the prior story of Adam? I think when we see the contrast between these two events, we'll find an answer. What was Adam's big celebration? He was celebrating God's overseeing of the natural world celebrating the fact that God breathed life into nature every single moment, continuing to sustain it each day. The light in Adam's story was the light of God powering nature. But on Hanukkah, we're celebrating a different kind of light. Adam felt threatened by the natural world turning against him. But on Hanukkah, we, the Jewish people, weren't worried about a natural disaster. No, this was a disaster concerning the affairs of mankind, human affairs. This was an imminent disaster in the story of history. The Jewish people's historic mission kindled by Abraham to bring humanity closer to God was on the threat of extinction by the Greeks. We were faced with a threat not to our physical survival, but to our national and spiritual survival, a threat to our role in history. And so this time, the miracle of Hanukkah was not that God hadn't abandoned nature, but that God hadn't abandoned the affairs of mankind, that God hadn't abandoned history. The military victory and the miracle of the menorah is a celebration of the deeply held Jewish conviction that God is involved in our lives, in the affairs of mankind, guiding our way forward. But notice another difference too. When Adam felt faced with a natural disaster, he had no choice but to look upwards and to pray. But on Hanukkah, when faced with a political and spiritual disaster, prayer was not enough. We had to act too. We had to wage war even though the odds were totally against us. And for the miracle of the menorah to occur, we had to light that first light. The message the rabbis of the Talmud are bringing us to is a powerful one, that when it comes to the affairs of man, to our national and spiritual well-being, while we must always rely on God ultimately, God wants us to make a move, to put in the effort, to kindle the first flame. And while it may ultimately all be in God's hands, God responds in kind to our actions. When we put in the effort, when we ignite that first flame, God responds by creating a light bigger than we could ever imagine. If we sense a coldness, a growing evil in the world, if we feel a growing darkness, we must not give in to despair. We must not mourn ourselves and eulogize the world. We must take responsibility and act, however futile it may feel, however much the odds may feel against us, whatever that light may be, and for each of us, it can be different in our own lives, in our own way. But light it, because when we do, God responds in kind. Happy Hanukkah. To stay up to date with JTV content, click subscribe here if you're on YouTube and hit the alarm bell. And if you're on Facebook, hit the like button and under following, click see first. If you enjoy watching JTV content, 
and want to help us continue to grow, please consider making a donation to us by clicking here.